Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. And in the studio with me, I'm very pleased to have a, an old friend and, and fellow for whom I have, a, I can't describe how much respect, uh, Jeff Cohen. Uh, he is the co-founder of RootsAction.org. He's a professor of journalism and the director of the Park Center for Independent, independent Media at Ithaca College. Uh, former producer of the Donahue Show. You've been around cable TV for years and, and I years. I was with Phil today. Aha! Uh-huh. And you and yeah. you wrote a book, Cable News in Confidential. Confidential. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, Jeff, what brings you to town? Uh, it's been an exciting day. I've got to tell you. Um, as Roots Action initiated a campaign on behalf of James Risen. Risen's one of the best investigative reporters in the country, works for the New York Times. He's had scoop after scoop after scoop, and the CIA hates him. His beat is intelligence. And right now, the Obama administration, continuing something that the Bush administration had dropped, uh, has a subpoena where they could, uh, where James Risen, if he doesn't name his confidential source, Mm. will end up behind bars. So uh, Roots Action, if you go to the rootsaction.org homepage, you'll see the petition. Right. We've started a petition a few weeks ago saying, we support James Risen because we support the freedom of the press. Why is the New York Times not raising hell about this? Um, there were, there's some Times reporters that I, th- I think they feel it'll be too self-interested, uh, I think. Um, well, then why isn't the Washington Post raising well, hell Well, that's the They've point. Got... I mean, here's what I've learned in the last few weeks. We initiated this campaign at Roots Action, and our original co-sponsors were groups like the Nation uh, com- uh, uh, Committee, uh, Center for Media and Democracy, right. FAIR, right. Freedom of the Press Foundation, Free Press, right. um, and what we real. And then we were joined. Now we've got a hundred thousand signatures on this petition, and we took the hundred thousand signatures this morning. This is the news hook and 4,000 pages, and we delivered them to the Justice Department today. Mm-hmm. And the, the petition basically says, drop all charges, uh, harassment of James Risen, threats to put him behind bars. Right. And in the last few weeks, we've been joined by the Committee to Protect Journalists, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a Government Accountability Project, Reporters Without Borders. All the journalist groups have signed on. Mm. And what we learned is, you know, a lot of the journalists, especially independent, you know, the individual journalists, they don't know how to do activism that well. Uh-huh. You know, uh-huh. activism is not something that come, is part of their nature. It wasn't something they learned in J school. <laughs> That's for sure. In fact, they learned how to be a little standoffish right. to activists. So we've done this campaign, and we started hearing from James Risen himself saying he's how grateful he is. I mean, this guy may be spending time in jail right. for doing reporting. And what was the thing that he exposed? He's exposed a lot of things that offended the CIA through different administrations. But the, in his 2000 book, State of War, James Risen wrote about a botched CIA operation from the year 2000, where the U.S. was giving nuclear weapons plans to Iran through an ex-Soviet scientist and it went completely awry and he learned about it from a whistleblower inside the cia and so they're prosecuting the person they believe to be a whistleblower and it looks like they're going to continue with their subpoena demanding that james rise and go on take the stand and say yes this was the source of the story now there's no issue about whether he's going to hurt some current cia operation this thing happened 14 years ago right the book came out eight years ago. The Bush administration dropped their subpoena against Risen, and typically the Obama administration continued harassing Risen. So if people out there, and we're here, one of your outlets is Free Speech TV for sure. sure. People care about free speech or free press. This, this wonderful investigative reporter for the New York Times, James Risen, is now the flashpoint. He's now mm. the center. And if you haven't heard of the petition or seen the petition, go on Roots Action, sign it, spread it. Um, RootsAction.org. Yeah. And uh, so I said to James Risen, uh, you know, he thanked me and Norman Solomon, who really initiated this, the other co-founder of RootsAction.org, said, I really want to thank you for what you've done. And then I said to him, I want to thank you for the investigative reporting you've done over the years and I hope you can get back to it soon. Yeah. Um, so it's a wonderful campaign. It was very uplifting. At the cam- at the, we delivered the hundred thousand signatures this morning to the Justice Department. Again, it's if Obama or Holder wanted to call this thing off, 
James Risen could have this this weight off of his head right. and could start, you know, and keep doing what he's done so well over the years. Which is what I think the administration's afraid of. Of course. And it's why, I mean, Risen is the guy right now, he's the focal point where they put the pressure on Risen, as they have on the whistleblowers themselves, like Snowden. Right. And the whole idea is to harass, And threaten. every reporter in America is thinking, if they can take down and send to prison a New York Times reporter, Yes. I work for the St. Louis Times Picayune or something. Right. I'm toast. Right. They'll do it and nobody will even notice. Right. Here, James Risen, Pulitzer Prize winner, right. uh, loved by his peers, very humble guy. Again, he Employed was very by... out of place at a news conference where he's the martyr. Yeah. You know, the, and, uh, but it, I mean, he's such a brave guy. He's basically told the administration, both administrations, Bush and Obama, I'm not giving up my source. Right. I've built a whole career doing this. Right. Uh, but the Obama administration has a war against the whistleblowers and the journalists who use whistleblowers, the deeply sourced reporters like right. James Risen. Norman told me he just read this book by the guy who was the CIA's legal affairs, legal advisor for decades. Right. And if you read the guy's book, Norman said page after page, you see the one reporter they feared the most was James Risen of the New York Times. So it's not an accident that they've come after Ryzen, it makes no legal sense, uh, you know, unless it's part of a political move to pressure and threaten all whistleblowers, all potential whistleblowers right. and potential journalists who use whistleblowers. Political is almost the wrong word. Um, it's more, uh, this is the rise of a fascist state. I mean, it, it, and I realize that sounds hyperbolic, but, you know, the First Amendment gives freedom of the press top billing. Right. That's yeah. what's so fascinating. We had the Reporters Without Borders representative at our news conference. I've just whisked over here from the yeah. news conference at the press club. And she pointed out that the United States, which invented freedom of the press. We're number 31 in the world? No. Now we're 46. 46. And the Reporters Without Borders does this, you know, country by country right. uh, press freedom index. Right. And because of what the Obama administration has done in the last couple of years, we went down 12 spaces and I think 12 places now. So there's, here's the country that invented the First Amendment, invented the concept of freedom of the press. When Tocqueville came over here, was it the 1830s? 1836. Yeah. He was just amazed at how there was like a self-governing people and they were reading newspapers everywhere. You right. didn't see that in monarchical Europe. Right. And uh, so we went from that pinnacle, you know, the top. We invented this concept of freedom of the press, and now there's 45 countries ahead of us, and we're dropping. And, and, and I think part of it is, the journalists don't talk about this a lot, but we can, um, which is, it's part of the permanent warfare state, yes. the permanent surveillance state, and when you have a couple million people with security clearances, and virtually everything dealing with foreign policy classified as top secret or secret, there's... Uh, you know, when you have a state of permanent war and permanent surveillance, there's going to be a war against whistleblowers and a war against journalists because those are the only ones who can inform the public what's going on. Right. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you. And meanwhile, we've got the situation going on in Ferguson, Missouri. And last <laughs> night, a Huffington Post reporter and a Washington Post reporter were arrested. The Washington Post reporter said to the cop who was arresting him, tomorrow you're going to be on the front page of right. the Washington Post. The guy said, get in the damn car. And it's sure enough, it's on the front page of the Washington Post. In fact, it's it's uh, right up at the top. There we go. Um, and and uh, huh, Washington Post is taking a while to load right now. But, but it, it's the you're you're right in connecting these issues. James Risen was asked about it at this news conference an hour ago about the harassment of journalists, and it, he said it is connected. Yeah, it's when you interfere with the ability of journalists to cover official action, whether it's a botched CIA operation from years ago, or the other thing that Risen uncovered was the warrantless wiretapping. Right. He was behind, he was one of the reporters involved in exposing that story, whether it's official action of that type, or it's the official action of police engaging with citizens on the streets. Uh, when you interfere with the uh, role of journalists in covering official action, you're right. It has a whiff of we're going in the wrong direction toward authoritarianism yeah. and away from freedom. More, more than a whiff. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a hell of a lot more than yeah. a whiff. And, and this is something that we've been seeing steadily grow in the United States since the 70s, basically since the Nixon administration. Um, you know, arguably over maybe, maybe you could take it even back to, to Woodrow Wilson with the Alien Sedition Acts, but 
But I think we really got tolerant of it during the anti-Vietnam War riots and the uh, weather underground, you know, and Simeon East, oh, right. we got terrorists among us, right. you know, and then right. 9-11, of course, put it on steroids. Um, now we've got this 1033 program where the Pentagon has given over $4 billion worth of weapons, battlefield armaments, oh, right. to police departments all across right. the United States. Right. And it's just it's but see, nuts. The, right, the and then they're using these against reporters. Right. The, right. Well, it happened during Occupy everywhere. Yeah. If you go on Free Press, you know, they were keeping a running tally of the dozens of journalists who on the streets were co trying to cover Occupy and were jailed, many of them mainstream journalists. And when they went to take back, when the cops went to take back Zuccotti Park, the original Occupy Wall Street in lower Manhattan, the first thing they did was round up the journalists, put them in pens, and the journalists who resisted were arrested. So, I mean, that is a real whiff of fascism when that kind of event happens. Uh, but, yeah, so, so today we're fighting back. At RootsAction.org is the petition to help James Risen. If James Risen can walk, if the Justice Department's, the Department backs, you know, away and says, okay, we're not going to prosecute him, that's a huge victory, and that will empower journalists to go out and do their jobs. You should be delivering those to every member of Congress, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jeff Cohen with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Bring it back to your calls and uh, my thoughts and Jeff's thoughts on them. We'll make this an interesting 15 minutes. Stick around. Welcome back. Tom Harmon here with you and Mike watching Free Speech TV in Chicago. Hey, Mike, you're on the air with me and Jeff Cohen. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering if you might know an answer to this, uh, what this uh, gentleman is referring to on his Twitter uh, thing, either you or Shano. He had stated, until the public comes to understand how the U.S. Supreme Court made public shootings easy to justify, the conversation can't move forward. What Supreme Court decision would that have been? I don't know. I'm 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 sorry. Shane is hitting the hitting the Google machine, but I, I don't know. You don't know either, Jeff. Okay, Bill. Uh, well, Bill, hang on. I, you're you're listening serious. You're on a break. Uh, Adam in Dayton, Ohio, watching Free Speech TV on the Direct TV satellite system. You wanted to talk about the Ohio State University campus, please. Yeah, Tom, uh, big fan. Thanks for all that I've learned from you. Yeah, the Ohio State campus police have an MRAP. Really? Uh, they got, yeah, uh, I read it in the Dayton Daily News about five or six months ago. I huh. don't know if they're afraid that Michigan's going to invade them or what. <laughs> yeah, ISIS is coming to uh, Ohio State University. Jeff, your thoughts yeah. on well, the, Yeah, I mean, I, I used to work at the Thank ACLU you. in Southern California on police uh, repression issues. When I think about what we were fighting back then in terms of trying to get the police to lower the level of violence, lower the use of force, you know, react slower to pulling the gun. And you think about the militarization of the police forces that have gone on year after year. It's scary as hell. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of profit to be made in it uh, alongside the expansion of the military industrial complex and the police industrial complex is profiteers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money in the security, it's one of the few booming industries we have in our country since 9-11 right. is and the security prison. industry, yeah, yeah. prison, and they all go together. And it's uh, every police force wants to have their latest military gadget. Um, and it's not good for the citizenry. It leads to overreaction. If you have all these uh, high-tech weaponry, you're going to use them. Rand and, Paul has an op-ed in today's Time magazine saying it's time to demilitarize our police. Isn't it interesting that the progressive members of Congress have gone relatively silent on issues like that? And it's a Ron Paul and Rand Paul that bring up an issue. Yeah, it's Rand it's, Paul. Yeah, yeah, the, it's yeah, crucial. Yeah, I, I, I find it astounding. Um, let's see. Brian, we have just a minute to the break. You got a quick one? Oh, uh, yes, Tom. How are you? Good. Good. Well, I want to touch uh, first on the Joe Hicks topic. I know we've passed that right now, but mm -hmm. he, uh, as an African American, American male myself, he was saying about, you know, I've heard this argument for almost 20 years now about, you know, the people from the border coming over, taking the jobs and so on. What they keep forgetting is that, like you, you told them back in the day, we were the ones that were supposedly, supposedly taking their jobs, right. wandering away and so on and so forth. And I, when I first moved in Charlotte, 
it was in 97, May 97, summer, very hot. We went on a construction site. I don't want to draw this out, but basically, you know, the guys were crying, you know, even the news. Oh, my God, the wrong people, they're coming over here taking jobs, this and that. I said, you have no control of that. Why are you moaning about that? You have no control. These are corporate uh, um, ideas. They're putting them here in these places because they're saving money. Oh, you're full of crap. I said, so you think they can walk in, walk right in and go into a job site and say, hey, get rid of half of uh, workers here. I brought a crew here from uh, yeah. Honduras, wherever. We're going to just make the wages better. We're going to make the labor better. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Well, and this, Brian, it was because in, in 1986, Ronald Reagan stopped enforcing the law against by and large, rich white employers hiring people who were not in the country legally. But it's, it's a, a point out, it's a bit of a digression. Back to Joe Hicks. Brian, thanks a lot for the call. We'll be back. back tom hartman here with you and uh, paul uh, i'm looking at Rand paul here on the screen jeff cohen in the studio with me and uh great to have you with us uh jeff you want to take some phone calls we'll sure just, we'll just you know react to what people have to say bill in fontana california hey bill thanks for listening to sirius Hi. what's up uh well you made the comment about hillary being a major um threat to or excuse me Rand paul being a major threat to hillary yeah, you know, I think maybe it would be better if Rand Paul beat Hillary. Uh, not that I really. If you want to do Rand away with Social Paul, Security and Medicare and unemployment insurance and minimum wages and and uh, turn all our roads into toll roads and end all public education, yeah. Well, I understand what you're saying, and his ec- I was going to say his economics scared the living daylights out of me, but uh, on the other hand. With regard to foreign policy, with regard to demilitarizing the police, with regard to pot, he's right. Civil I, liberties. You know, yeah, yeah he, civil liberties. Hillary's, you, Hillary's awful, and he's good. And But you're right. On all the economic issues, Hillary's weak, and he's atrocious. You yeah, know? yeah. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, that's a could, tough one. Your call, this caller has raised a conundrum. Yeah. Well, that's why I, you know, I think there's about a 10% chance that Rand Paul will be the Republican nominee. It's, it's a bold, Goldwater Hail Mary, but I, yeah. you know, he's, he's really working it hard. Yeah. And he's, and he may have Coke money behind him. We'll see, you know, but anyhow, Michael in Denver. Hey, Michael, what's up? Good afternoon, Tom and uh, Jeff. I, I just want to call up here uh, from um, following what's been going on in, in, in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, I late brother was uh, NYPD. He got out of the academy in 1964. And before that, he had been uh, in, in the Army, in Special Forces. Mm. He was uh, uh, actually in the first training class for uh, the first organized SWAT union mm. in, in uh, New York City. This is going back to the um, late 60s, early 70s. Right. And he, he, made, he made an observation he once, being in, in Vietnam, he had to work with the police in Saigon, mm-hmm. and he would say, we complain here about what the police does here. Ironically, he changed just before he passed away, that, the opinion I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. But he said, people here think that we're treating our people bad. You should see what they do overseas, like in Vietnam and Saigon, where you sure. literally disappear. And 30, at, well, 30 years later, before he passed away, he had a 180-degree turn because he saw the militarization of our police force. And he said, it, literally, the, 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 the police now was a paramilitary arm of big corporations. Yeah, you give them a gun and a badge, and, and they step outside of society. Exactly. That's what he said. Exactly, Tom. That's, that's what, what he said. said. Okay. Away from Michael, society. Michael, thanks for raising the topic. Jeff, you want to riff on that? No, I just I think it's such an important point. I worked at the ACLU of Southern California when there's a rash of police shootings on unarmed people, mm. uh, largely black people, and uh, inexcusable loss of life. And I think we've gone downhill since then. You know, mm. it was a huge political issue in the 1980s in Los Angeles, and I think we're more out of control. Um, there, I, I mean, this is another issue like freedom of the press. The United States invented freedom of the press, and now we're behind 45 countries. Right. The U.S. invented this idea 
that the individual can stand up to the state, that, this, that there's this right called habeas corpus. Right. You can't be tossed and disappeared. You get to meet a judge. You have a jury of your peers. We invented all of that stuff. And with the militarization of society, we're losing what, uh, where uh, the United States was clearly exceptional. Yeah. You know? Well, we, or yeah. at least we broadened it. Uh, habeas corpus is Articles 38 and 39 of the Magna Carta. Right. Okay. Which yeah, but we brought some old, of these but, things. But it only applied to the aristocracy. Right. I mean, think about uh, the things in, the, uh, in our Constitution at the end of the 18th century of uh, jury of your peers, right to a fair and speedy trial. Right. I mean, we were so ahead of the world. We opened yeah. and, and we seem to be backsliding. Yeah. And it's all in the name of security, war on terror, war on crime. There's always going to be a war on something that gives a politician an excuse to take away our, our rights. I think that um, a lot of this is coming out of politicians trying to get political advantage. This goes back to the, to, you know, Goldwater did this a little bit. But Nixon did it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, basically the culture wars. I'm speaking yeah. for the silent majority. And you know, what he meant was the silent white majority. Right. And, and that, that, uh, and, and Ronald Reagan, his first speech as he's running for president was down in Philadelphia, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and he's talking about states' rights. I mean, there's been all this racial code embedded on top of, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, was openly anti-students, uh, you know, I, I mean, when he yeah. was in the governor of the state of California, he said horrible things about the students and, and cut their funding, did away <laughs> with free schools. So we've got politicians who, who over the years have found, you know, strong coffee for a strong America, right? Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon. I mean, you know, it's like, got to be tough. Right. Well, that's what's so interesting that uh, Rand Paul and before him, Kucinich and Ron Paul, right. that they stood up against this. That yeah. they, it's very rare that when there's this, or an uh, or a era of fear, right. uh, and all the politicians are trying to outdrug each other, outgun each other, right. outlaw and order each other. And it was and only then, Barbara Lee. Yeah, Barbara Lee on that vote, I think back to the, the Gulf of Tonkin hoax, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that led to the Vietnam War, and there were two lonely senators that right. stood up against it. Right. The Wayne Pate, Morris. Wayne Morris and Ernest Gruning from Alaska, Wayne Morris from Oregon. Or think of the Patriot Act. Yeah. Right after 9-11, and you have one guy, Feingold, mm -hmm. who said no. <laughs> you know, there's always these few brave ones. But the thing that it will empower the few brave ones to keep speaking out is the grassroots organizing. That's why I encourage people interested in all of these issues to go to, to rootsaction.org. Go rootsaction yeah, because rootsaction.org is fighting on all of these issues against war, against secrecy, against militarization of society, against the surveillance state. That's great. Rootsaction.org is the website. Jeff Cohen, our guest, author of Cable News Confidential and many other things. Uh, be sure to check out rootsaction.org.